And now, my pleasure to introduce, no, I'm standing in front of you, <laughs> Baptiste Lebihan. Thank you, Karen. Um, all right, so what I want to do today is to talk about uh, uh, space-time emergence. And I would like to explore the idea that space-time emergence might be um, functional realization. So I will do that um, by giving a metaphysical look at what's going on. And I will uh, have a look at the uh, philosophy of mind literature. Like um, Eleanor, I agree that it's a mess, this literature. But still, I think it's, it's possible to find useful distinctions there. Uh, it may be useful to get a better understanding of what uh, space-time functionalism is or, or, or could be. So uh, let me put some context. So uh, in contemporary physics, it seems that many theories uh, entail that space or space-time emerges from a structure in which interesting features of space uh, and time are missing. So this is so in many approaches to quantum gravity, for instance, in loop quantum gravity and string theory, but also in a particular approach to uh, quantum uh, mechanics, configuration space realism. So a general problem is this. What is this relation of emergence? Uh, what sort of ontologic to, sorry, ontological picture follows from space-time emergence? And um, there is, yes, uh, is it, could we think of space-time emergence? Uh, as functional realization. And so here I use a neutral word of, uh, uh, of emergence because I think that when philosophers of physics use the word uh, emergence or the expression emergence of space time, it's more the name of a problem. They don't commit to a particular philosophical notion of, uh, of emergence as we find it in the philosophical literature. So here are uh, two claims I will defend. So maybe they won't be very clear uh, right now, but I hope at the end uh, of the talk it will be clear. So space-time functionalism does not solve the hard problem of space-time emergence, just as functionalism about the mind does not solve uh, the hard problem of consciousness. So here maybe it's not very clear what I mean by hard problem, but uh, as I said, it will be uh, clearer later. And here is the second claim, space-time functionalism comes in many versions which trigger uh, different answers to the hard problem of space-time emergence. So here I, uh, I give you two examples of uh, potential uh, emergence of space-time uh, from something which is not space-temporal. So the first example is in string theory, it seems that the four-dimensional space-time emerges from a ten-dimensional uh, structure. Right, so from 10 dimensions, uh, we arrive to uh, four dimension. According to a naive understanding, well, there is no real interesting problem of uh, emergence because uh, it's just that we don't see the additional dimensions. They are compactified close on, the sum, on themselves, uh, and we fail to notice them when we zoom out. But uh, since there are five different uh, dual uh, string theories, uh, which are empirically equivalent, so it's what's called duality. Um, it seems that we have a, a problem. It's not clear how we are going to recover geospace space-time, general relativity, from uh, these five uh, theories. So it's not only that we have to find a more fundamental series thanks to this uh, dual theory, but we also want to recover uh, geospace space-time. So it's what Nick Huggett uh, discussed in one of his papers. And he says that the classic story about the compactification of an observed dimensions uh, does not explain away uh, the emergence of uh, GL space-time. So here, let's keep in mind that we have a problem, a conceptual discrepancy between the idea of five series and just one series, uh, GL space-time. So I don't want to enter uh, into the possible ways to understand duality, but in most of the understanding of duality, we have something weird going on, and it seems that some uh, um, crucial features of space, uh, of space time are missing. So here is a second example, uh, loop quantum gravity. So there it's uh, quite uh, it's well known that on one side we have uh, a discrete structure made of quanta, which is, um, which is supposed to be uh, um, fuzzy. And on the other side we have uh, a geospace space time, which is continuous, uh, not fuzzy. And we also have um, uh, what uh, I've called um, 
but we may call um, uh, a structural deviation. Sometimes it happens at large distance in the uh, geostate space-time, maybe mapped onto relation to F uh, adjacency in the fundamental structure. So here I think we have an example of uh, a potential case of space-time emergence. How are we going to explain the conceptual discrepancy between the continuous definite on the one hand uh, and the discrete fuzzy and structurally deviant on the other hand? Right, so we have two things which, seems, which seem to be different. How are we going to, to relate to that? So faced with the, what I call the explanatory gap, which, which is an abstract notion which covers all the potential cases of uh, conceptual discrepancy between a theory of quantum gravity and GR, uh, what are we going to, to do? Right? So we, we may want to try to narrow the conceptual discrepancy between QG and GR, uh, for instance, by uh, trying to uh, massage a bit of GR to uh, to find um, a version of GR which is uh, closer, which has uh, primitive notion, notions which are closer to the primitive notions of, of uh, QG. So we try to have a version of general relativity which is a bit less spatial temporal as usually assumed. Um, we can try to go the other way around. We can try to elaborate a QG approach more in line uh, with the primitive notions of GR. So here I think about people saying that space-time comes first, um, and that we should try to accept that space-time is there and start with this assumption. We can also try to go both directions uh, and to find a middle way by saying that both GR and QG are partially spatial temporal. So we try to, to narrow the explanatory gap. Um, by going in both uh, directions. But what I want to discuss now is that is uh, the possibility that there uh, might be a residual gap, right? that we don't manage to completely reduce the exploratory gap, the cognitive dissonance between the primitive notions of uh, GR and the primitive notions of, uh, of uh, QG. And so for now, let's call this the ontological problem, how to explain this gap. So now I think there are many uh, options. So a first option is to say, well, it's just a brute fact about the natural world. Uh, there is an explanatory gap. We have uh, these two sets of primitive notions. And there is nothing to say uh, about it. But maybe we want to say something and try to, to formulate an answer, an explanation of why there is a primitive, um, sorry, why there is a discrepancy between uh, these sets of notions. So the idea would be to say that the discrepancy is non-primitive. We can say something uh, about it. So we could try to uh, explain it with a mind dependent building relation, like uh, uh, philosophical emergence, functional realization, grounding, composition, or maybe identity. Or we may want to say, well, the discrepancy is not grounded in a mind independent uh, relation. Uh, it's grounded in an illusion. So here is the idea is to extend uh, what is called the B-theory of time, right, the metaphysics literature. So you want to say in the same way, so the story goes like this, uh, in the philosophy of uh, time, the standard position about the flow of time is that time is not flowing uh, in the world. It's more projection that we put on top of the world. What we have in the world are temporal relations. Um, and for some reason, we have some kind of cognitive illusion that time is flowing, uh, a phenomenal experience of time passing. So maybe we should have the same kind of approach and include not only the flow of time, but time itself and even space and space time and say that our, the whole of our experience, of our spatial temporal experience, is an illusion. So I think we have these different uh, approaches here. And what interests me here is that we have roughly three big uh, ontological pictures of uh, what's going on. So first, we have the derivative space-time view, according to which GR space-time exists. It's derivatively real. It's a framework of an ontologically la layered, namely an anti-reductionist uh, picture of the world, so layers of reality. You have the spatial-temporal derivative layer. 
and you have the more fundamental um, non-spatial temporal layer. The second op op option is to uh, go reductionist and to say, well, geospace time exists, but for somehow it's identical with parts of the fundamental structure, maybe not with the whole structure, but with some parts of it, maybe some properties of it. And the decomposition of the fundamental structure into GR space-time um, results then in spatial temporal future. And finally, I think there is a third uh, metaphysical option, which is eliminativism about space-time. According to this approach, space-time does not exist at all, and it merely arises because of mathematical limitations and procedures, which so will be more uh, linked to um, uh, a mathematical artifact. Um, but there will not be space-time, properly speaking, in the world. All right, so um, what I, I will do now is try to relate uh, this ontological problem um, with some uh, quotes uh, by uh, uh, Vincent and Chris in the last uh, paper called Space-Time is a Space-Time Does. Um, so what they do in that paper is that they, are, they try to use, sorry, they use uh, uh, <laughs> Maybe I'm just trying. <laughs> I will say I'm quite confused about the problem of empirical incoherence. So, my bad. So, um, they want to use space time functionalism as a strategy to solve the problem of empirical incoherence, which is a distinct problem. So, let me um, briefly uh, remind you about what it is. Uh, Vincent talked about it this morning. Um, Measurements and observations, which are evidence for a particular physical theory, happen somewhere, somewhere. But how could it be so if there is no space-time? Do we have a theory uh, that says that its uh, evidential claims are deeply false? Right. So at least we have a tension. But if we have a theory which says that uh, its evidence are not true. But the thing is, I'm not really uh, worried about this, uh, pro, uh, this particular issue of uh, empirical incoherence. Uh, in particular, I agree with uh, Elisa Ney when she says that a theory of confirmation should not impose a priori constraint on the ontological nature of evidence. So perhaps we wrongly believe that our evidence is localized in space and time or in space time. Um, but maybe it's it's not um, transparent. We don't know exactly what the ontological status of our evidence is at the end of the day. So I don't really think that there is a hard problem here. Um, so what's the exact relation between the problem of empirical incoherence and the ontological problem? Well, I'm not sure. For me, it's still quite complicated. It seems to me that when people address uh, the problem of empirical coherence, they appeal to some particular claims that would relate to the ontological problem, and that particular solutions to the problem of empirical incoherence uh, entail particular solutions uh, to the ontological problem and vice versa. But my project today is to clarify the ontological problem and to show that functionalism does not help there. So I will not speak uh, again about space-time functionalism, but I wanted to, to make this clear because I will refer to some quotes by uh, Vincent and Chris um, about um, what I call the ontological problem. It's not the main part of their essay, but still they say some, some interesting things there that I want to, to discuss. Okay, so what do they say uh, on that? So here is the first quote. Uh, one central intuition we investigate is that space-time need not be fully recovered in some strong ontological sense in order to provide the grounds for empirical evidence and everyday experience, but only certain functionally relevant features. Here is a second quote. We will investigate to what extent a functionalist perspective allows us to bridge the metaphysical gap between the structures postulated by these theories and smooth classical space-time as we find it in GR. Here's third quote, so there will be four quotes. 
don't worry. <laughs> Whether one ultimately wishes to be a realist or an eliminativist about space-time is also going to our concern here. And finally, from a functionalist point of view, nothing remains beyond showing how the fundamental degrees of freedom can collectively behave such as they appear spatial-temporal and macroscopic scales in all relevant and empirically testable ways. This turns out to be a hard task in quantum gravity. Functionalism can be seen as the assertion that once this task is completed, no unfinished business lingers on. Using a terminology from philosophy of mind, functionalism will then amount to the denial that there is a hard problem beyond the easy problem of the emergence of space-time. So I think there is a tension uh, here in these uh, quotes uh, because there is a shift from the claim that function, functionalism is orthogonal to the hard problem to the claim that functionalism solves or dissolves uh, the hard problem. So what I want to do now is to analyze and aim at solving this tension by proposing different uh, uh, interpretations of this series of, uh, of quotes. So, uh, and we will see, I will propose three or, or four uh, interpretations of how to, to understand these quotes. And so in order to do so, I will focus first on the uh, hard problem of consciousness and the hard problem of space-time. And then I will move on to the uh, mind functionalism and then space-time functionalism. All right, so let's start with a quote uh, from David Chalmers about the hard problem of consciousness. It's from a, uh, a recent uh, manuscript called uh, The Meta Problem of Consciousness. So he, he writes, the hard problem contrast with the easy problems of explaining various behavioral functions such as learning, memory, perceptual integration, and verbal report. The easy problems are easy because we have a standard paradigm for explaining them. To explain a behavioral function, we just need to find an appropriate neural or computational mechanism that performs the function. We know how to do this, at least in principle. In practice, the cognitive science has been making steady progress on the easy problems. So the easy problems, uh, basically, it's, uh, we want to find systematic correlations between uh, physical or neurobiological states on one side and uh, mental states. Uh, and we want to explain further these cor correlations in functional terms. So here I don't want to, because one may ask what is a function. Uh, some people have uh, talked about this today. Uh, in the philosophy of my literature, functions have been linked to um, causal roles, to uh, teleological, biological functions, uh, and to mathematical functions. So we, even in the philosophy of mind, we have different trends. Uh, different way to think of, uh, of functionalism, but I, I won't discuss this here. I will just uh, use uh, a neutral notion of uh, functional role. And so the hard problem then is to analyze ontologically the relation uh, between physical states and mental states. And there we have a few options. Dualism on identity theory between the uh, mental and physical states or we could be eliminativist about mental states and say, well, there are no mental states, they are just physical states. So in terms of your mind, then, there is this famous question about qualia. Um, is there still something to be explained if you have functionalized everything? So you explain all the mental states uh, in functional terms. Um, it seems that there is still something more to be explained. It's a classical object, objection, right? So um, there in the recent paper, uh, Chalmers called um, uh, the, let's admit that you're an eliminativist, you believe that the mind is not real, there are no qualia. Um, uh, you still have another problem, right? If you solve the hard problem by saying that the that mental states are not real, then you will have what, is, what he calls the meta problem, which is to explain why we uh, have, um, um, why we produce wrong um, uh, reports, why we say that we experience something peculiar, particular about what it is like to feel or experience, for instance, redness. So there is something tricky here. Uh, it's a ponder of books. Are we going to, to, to deal with uh, qualia, the philosophy of mind? Uh, 
But I want to say this right now because I will compare this issue with uh, the equivalent with space-time functionals. All right, so uh, let's move on to the uh, case of space and emergence. Here again, I think it's possible to distinguish between easy and hard problems. Right, so the easy problem will be to derive spatial temporal series from the non-spatial temporal theory with mathematical tools. So basically to derive GR from one particular theory of quantum gravity. So of course it's a bit funny to call it the easy problem since it's one of the main tasks of quantum gravity and it's not easy at all, but it's just to keep the analogy with the philosophy of mind. And then we have the hard problem, uh, which is basically what I introduced as the ontological problem. Uh, should we go dualist, reductionist, or eliminativist? What should we do with uh, uh, spatial temporal states or spatial temporal properties? Should we try to eliminate them, or should we accept that they are real? Or should we try to reduce them to, um, to more fundamental building blocks described by QG? So what I want to, to argue for now is that a broad functionalist strategy does not solve the hard problem. <coughs> Contrary to what has been suggested by uh, Vincent and Chris, because there are many sorts of functionalism, and they, le they lead to different alternative uh, solutions to the hard problem. But uh, <coughs> for doing so, I would like to address an objection uh, which has been voiced uh, by um, Eleanor Knox, and uh, Vincent and Chris discuss uh, this uh, objection in the draft uh, I'm referring to. Um, and the objection is like this. Well, there is no analogy between the what it is like to experience red and the what it is like to be space or time or space-time. So we don't really have um, a hard problem with space-time. Uh, we should not care about that. But here I want to say, I want to push back a bit and say, well, I agree on something. First, I agree that the phenomenal dissonance is not of the same kind, because first, um, in the case of space-time, it's grounded in our intuitions about concepts to be found in the two series, not in our phenomenal experience, in our introspection. So it does not have the same source. And second, it's uh, potentially weaker that the conceptual discrepancy between physical and mental concepts, or between our, our experience of redness and our concept of the physical. So I agree that there are in interesting and important differences. But even if uh, the conceptual discrepancy is weaker in the case of uh, space-time um, realization, space-time emergence, and even if it has a different source, well, there is still an explanatory gap to account for, right? It's where we started from. So, uh, I'm really happy if, uh, if uh, I'm becoming the straw man of uh, Eleanor, really thinking that there is a, a genuine uh, explanatory gap here. But, um, I mean, I want more. If, if, if you want to argue that there is no explanatory gap uh, with space-time emergence, um, it's not enough to say that uh, it's weaker than the explanatory gap in the philosophy of mind, or that it has a different source. I think there is something more to be said to explain why there is no explanatory gap. All right, so now I want to turn to my uh, third part, which is about mind functionalism and space-time functionalism. And what I will do basically is to distinguish between different uh, kinds of functionalism. Um, I will show that each kind of functionalism leads to a different approach to the ontological problem. So let's start with this quote from uh, Van Gulik. According to, one, to what one might call analytical functionalism, mental concepts can be analyzed in purely functional terms. That is, the meanings of such concepts can be explicated in terms of conditions that can themselves be specified using only functional concepts. In contrast with ontological functionalists who assert identities or reductions among real-world real world items such as properties, 
Analytical functionalists assert on identity or reduction among our ways of describing or thinking about the world. So here we have a, a distinction between analytic functionalism and ontological functionalism. So analytic functionalism is about mental predicates. So here we are talking about the language. When ontological functionalism is about mental properties, the mind, right? And um, if we want to say a bit more about, uh, about, if we want to describe a bit more analytic functionalism, um, it seems that since it's about the language, it does not say anything about the hard problem. In fact, it does, not, it does not say anything on the relation between functions or functional roles and mental properties. It's only about uh, the relation between functional roles and mental predicates. So it's about the language. So for instance, uh, if you are an uh, analytic functionalist, you may have different approaches to, uh, um, to, to the ontology. You can say different things about what's over there in the world. You could be, for instance, like Daniel Dennett, an eliminativist functionalist, and say that, well, there are no mental states, but still we can use uh, analytic functionalism as a tool to explain why we, the, the notion of uh, mental state is uh, relevant or useful. So as one, as von Gulick says, they accept the importance of holistic interdependence in analyzing mental state concepts, but nonetheless regard the truth makers for mental attributions as solely facts about actual and counterfactual behavior. So here it's a form of eliminativist functionalism which is very close to uh, logical behaviorism. But then, from this form of analytic uh, functionalism, one may want to move to a more ontological claim, and this ontological claim does not have to be eliminativism, the one mental states. In fact, we have uh, various options. So first we have occupant functionalism, uh, which is also called uh, realizer functionalism. And <clears throat> this form of functionalism is uh, in the spirit of the original type type identity theory, according to which uh, mental types are identical with uh, physical types. And here, functionalism should be regarded as a tool to defend the type type identity theory, or at least to defend an identity theory. And the idea is that, well, although we discover empirically that pain is identical with a particular neurological state, Still, we have a form of analytic functionalism at the linguistic level, at the level of the theory. So as von Gulick says here, uh, the role associated with a given mental kind serves as a means to secure reference to the relevant property, but it does not typically give the identity or essence of that property, which must instead be discovered through empirical investigation. All right, so now here is another ontological functionalism, maybe the most uh, famous form, it's role functionalism. According to it, each mental property is identified with the property of playing a particular role. Right? So von Gunnick again, the properties of being pain and of playing the pain role are regarded as one and the same property. If one thinks instead in terms of properties had by whole person, such as that of being in pain, the role functionalist will identify such mental properties with the property of being in some state which plays a relevant role. Right, so here it's more second order uh, kind of uh, functionalism. So here is my take on, on the useful classification of, of, uh, of uh, mind functionalism which we could use in the, um, to analyze space-time images. So first, we have analytic functionalism, right? Mental predicates are analyzed partially or totally in functional terms. And then we may move to three different sorts of uh, functionalism. Occupant functionalism, which is a conjunction of analytic functionalism plus a commitment to an identity theory. Eliminativist functionalism, Eliminativist functionalism, sorry, which is a conjunction of analytic functionalism plus eliminativism. And role functionalism, 
which is not uh, based on analytic functionalism, but which, take, which takes very seriously the idea of, uh, of uh, functional role and reifies the roles and thinks that, well, roles are part of the ontological furniture in the world. And so role functionalism contains a form of property uh, dualism in the same sense because um, I will say more about this uh, later, but because um, the realizers and the roles realized by these realizers have different model properties. So they cannot be identified. So now let's move on to um, what's the time? Okay, great. So let's move on to uh, space-time functionalism. So analytic functionalism is the view that the concept of space-time, or the predicate of space-time, or predicates associated with space-time, uh, are described by functional roles in some theory. So at first glance, it seems to me that uh, it would be the kind of uh, functionalism that Elena Knox defends, but uh, Gio. Um, we could be an ontological functionalist and say that, well, um, it's more than a purely analytic form of, uh, it's, it's not only about the language, it's about the ontology. And here we have as a claim that there is a relation between ontological contra theoretical roles and realizers. And this relation might be identity, realizer, realization, sorry, or elimination. But the point is that you you appeal to some um, relation about what's what's going on in the world. It's not only we are not talking about the language only anymore. So um, first option, the first option is role functionalism. According to it, space time is a mind independent structure described by GR, realized by another more fundamental structure described by QG. And so, as I said here, um, roles are numerically distinct from realizer since they don't share the same model properties. So you can think here about uh, multi-realizability. Then basically that geospace time could be instantiated or realized by different fundamental structure, just like uh, one software can be run by different hardwares. So here you have really the idea that you have <coughs> numerical distinction between uh, GL space-time and the more fundamental structure. So you have a form of property dualism, or maybe not property dualism, but you have something which, then, which looks like dualism. Second option is uh, occupant functionalism. Um, in this case, we may refer to the realizers, the building blocks of, structure, of the structure described by QG. Uh, as linguistic roles uh, in GR. And here the identity is that spatial, sorry, here's the idea is that spatial temporal entities are identical with non spatial temporal entities. So, what does it mean? It seems to be a bit contradictory, but what it means is that, in fact, we are only referring to one thing in both GR and, and, and um, QG, but we don't refer to this thing with the same concepts. And your concept may have different connotations. And they are not transparent, right? They don't deliver the nature of what they refer to. So here we have kind of analytic functionalism plus an identity theory. And finally, maybe it's, we could also think of a, of a kind of eliminativist functionalism, according to which we do not refer to anything with GR. And the functionalist machinery works for some reason which is not effectiveness of uh, functional roles uh, in general. So here we will have analytic functionalism plus eliminativism about uh, GR space time. All right, so I'm not saying that all of these positions are good or well motivated, but I think at least we should distinguish between them in order to, to assess them. All right, so a uh, last quote uh, from uh, Vincent and Chris, just to, to come back to their uh, essay. Although one may read our article as an expression of role functionalism, we remain uncommitted between role functionalism and occupant functionalism. 
so it, in fact, you talked about uh, realizer functionalism, but here yeah, I identified realizer functionalism with occupant functionalism. In fact, we wish to leave open the possibility of resisting the dichotomy. And here is the first point. So I think, fair enough, but um, I want to, to go a bit further. If role functionalism is a correct interpretation uh, of their approach, then they are committed to the derivative space-time view. And it's not orthogonal to the hard problem. They, their view has a, a particular entail. It entails a particular answer to the hard problem. Secondly, if they resist the dichotomy, then they are not solving or dissolving the hard problem of space-time emergence because they, only, because they will only appeal to analytic functionalism. Um, because I think one particular interpretation is that you just use analytic functionalism, and that's it. You don't say anything more. But if that's the case, then there are, again, two uh, options. First, you could say, well, we want to be neutral. We don't have any ontological commitment. Um, fair enough, but then it's just that you are not considering the hard problem uh, of space and emergence. You are not saying anything about it. Or here is another interpretation. Maybe there is no dichotomy because um, we should not distinguish between, the, between these various kinds of uh, ontological functionalism. But then I want to ask why. If, if that's what uh, you want to, to do, then there is an argumentative gap in the justification of the claim that there, there is no hard problem. There is something more to be explained. And in fact, I think another option would be to be eliminativist. You could say, well, we want to defend, to use analytic functionalism as a tool. And since GR is not a fundamental theory, we don't take it seriously. So we are eliminativist about GR space. But I just want to, to show that there are different uh, ontological interpretations of what's going on. And there are different ontological interpretations of what's going on if you analyze space-time emergence as being uh, space-time functional realization. So to conclude, um, I think that the functional treatment of space-time emergence does not solve the hard problem because it's consistent with at least four distinct functionalist views. And this argumentative issue is orthogonal to Lamps and British claims that functionalism solves the problem of empirical incoherence. Uh, on this point, I have nothing to say. And perhaps, also want something I want to say, perhaps the ontological problem is not empirical enough to be interesting, right? My suspicion is that uh, most philosophers of physics, they don't care about the ontological problem. And the reason why they don't care is that it's not related to the empirical world. There is no real empirical way to solve the matter, to, to set up the issue. So perhaps we should just remain silent on the issue and not uh, addressing the issue. But still, uh, if that's the motivation for not taking into account the hard problem of space-time, I think that it's not, that, it's not because functionalism, functionalism explains or make the issue go, go away. It's, it's really because um, we have separate motivation for not taking seriously this, this issue or for not caring about it, but it's not functionalism which solves or dissolves the hard problem of space and emergence. Right, thank you. Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think then, then this, this might be, this might be uh, something that yeah, someone uh, misleading from my side. Because so you, 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 you don't say it like that. Like <laughs> 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 no, you, you don't say it explicitly. What you say is that, um, yes, so I, I take this to be equivalent to that. Because you say that you wish to be, you don't care about whether we should be realist or eliminativist. Okay. I see now the, the, the reading that you have. But no, my, my question is, 
we define the problem as um, should we go for reductionism, eliminativism, these kind of questions mm -hmm. consecutive with our problem. Is, is that yes, that's correct. But then, then it's, it's, a, it's a reduction strategy. And it's sorry, in this sense, it's all our problem, no? It's, it's plain, the, the, the plain um, naive reading of the functional strategy. It's, it's a functional, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a strategy for functionally reducing classical smooth mm -hmm. GR space time to. To, to, to the, 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 the level below. Mm -hmm. So you, whether, we, whether it, it fully works or not, this is another, so how it where the details and so on are, it's another so I, issue. But, okay. but to answer your, your question is, okay, so is you, we should go for reductionism. Okay, so, so you mean that um, for you it's obvious that what the kind of functionalism that you want to, to, to defend is uh, what I've called occupant functionalism? I'm not sure about an identity theory, reductive, a reductive kind of functionalism. I think it's a reductive project, probably yes. Mm -hmm. and, and but then the, the, the further, more metaphysical distinctions. That's that's a footnote uh, where we want to not to commit ourselves. I'm, I'm not sure mm -hmm. about about the translation of these conceptions in the in the space time context. But to answer the broad question about whether it's a reductive project, yes, it is. Okay, but fair enough. But if you say this, then I take you to defend a particular kind of functionalism, which okay. is occupant functionalism, yeah. and you don't you don't really have um, multi realizability in this case, which might be a good thing in the case of, of space time functionalism. Okay. Okay. But then, then I would take you to react to what I said as, well, uh, of course we defend this particular sort of of, uh, of uh, functionalism, and it's not it's not world functionalism, it's occupant functionalism. Um, yeah, okay, I have to think about the, the, the more um, metaphysical subtleties there, but, but still I think, uh, because you, you, I, I took you, beyond this, this detail, I took you, one of your uh, arguments to be a point to be, to be that with the, with the functional strategy we are advocating in this paper, we are not solving the hard problem. Mm -hmm. Are we not? Yes, I think you, I think you are not because in order to solve the hard problem, you have to take position. On, on you have position. to say something more. You have to say something more. You have to say whether you defend uh, occupant functionalism or role functionalism, and how you define exactly your functionalism. Okay. So for you, it's not enough us just saying that it's, uh, it's uh, we, we we advocate a kind of functional reduction of space, of smooth space time to something else, and and then the, the more metaphysical subtleties we we leave them open. It's yes, I mean, what you, for me, what you wrote is consistent with many, several metaphysical interpretations, mm -hmm. and perhaps it's what you show, or you could say that you don't, since you don't really care about the metaphysical subtleties, uh, you don't engage with this issue. But then I hope that it may, uh, this classification may help you to explain exactly what, on what you don't commit to exactly. Okay. And just another very small comment, you talk about the role of space-time as a whole. Um, yeah. We are a bit uh, more uh, focused on that in the sense that first we want to recover certain localized, if you want, uh, space-time sure, sure. uh, roles of space-time features, yeah. uh, and then spe and specifically the ones which are directly relevant for making sense of political data, rather than recovering or trying to define the role of space-time as a whole. Fair enough. I, I mean, I was thinking about the metaphysical subtleties, but not necessarily about these physical subtleties. Do you want to add to Yes, please, if I may. Uh, so thank you very much. This is, this is helpful. Maybe I can explain a little bit what our project is and what we mean by the various quotes, so that, that they appear a little bit less inconsistent, perhaps. And maybe, uh, maybe at the end, uh, what it boils down to is that we have a slightly different understanding of what the hard problem is. Mm. And maybe we're wrong about that, but uh, let me explain. So I think Bethesda has already said that it's ultimately a, some kind of reductionist program. You're trying to understand uh, what are the aspects and features of space-time that we should care about, which are relevant. Uh, for empirical confirmation, for all sorts of other theoretical purposes, perhaps, whatever. But, you know, what are the important features of that? And 
how could we get them from some fundamental, more fundamental theory of quantum gravity? Uh, how could we reduce these features and things in effectively to something in the more fundamental structures or combinations of the more fundamental entities or you know some something like that? That is definitely the program. Um, it's a bit like trying to understand you know how come. We have this this table where we know that you know that this is really sort of built up from other stuff in interesting ways. So let's analyze uh, the tabularity of this uh, thing, and we do that and we analyze the constitution and we come to the conclusion: oh, there are sort of elementary particles; they combine in such and such ways. Oh, here's come here's how you know there's this table that has. The solidity, the form, the color, etc., all the sort of properties we get. Okay? Now, what we are not interested in, uh, at least that's what I had in mind when I wrote this, is whether then, once you successfully concluded a project like that, whether then you say, oh, so I just say there's the elementary particles and no tables, or whether the tables are just the elementary particles, or whether you, you think the table is something over and above. The, uh, that's sort of the uh, metaphysical debate we, we're not interested in pursuing. That's what we're trying to uh, put away here in a quote like that. Um, we're really interested in understanding that relationship and, and the, you know, the, the solve that reductive problem somehow. Now, when we then say that um, we think uh, our attitude uh, sidesteps or avoids or dissolves the hard problem, we don't mean to say that um, you know it sort of takes a, a, a stance or a position in that debate or something like that debate. What we mean to say is that. Um, you can show by pursuing this program, if it's successfully concluded, that the, the qualia, the friend of qualia, of space-time qualia, has nothing left to complain about. There's sort of no remaining explanatory task to be fulfilled. Uh, so that's what we, so the hard problem is like, you know, once you've understood all the, the aspects of the, of, this, of the easy problem, then, then there's the big problem of quality that you have to solve. And we think our attitude and our argument is supposed to show that no, there's nothing left to be done. If there's nothing, you know, with philosophy of mind be as it may, but in, in philosophy of space time, there's nothing that's somehow left there to be explained. That's what we mean when we say there's no hard problem left. Does this make a, a bit more sense? Yeah, it makes. Perfectly sense. Actually, I think we could distinguish between the hard problem, as you describe it, namely the friend um, satisfying the friend of uh, special temporal qualia by saying, "Well, you see, we explain everything there is to explain from another problem of uh, hard problem of space-time, which is what's what's the solution between the four candidates between uh, um, eliminativism, dualism, etc." Because I think even if you say that. Uh, you explain everything there is to explain. Well, still you have the you still have the choice between all these options, and you didn't. Um, you didn't give a reason to believe that it's that it's not that you are not entitled to ask this question. I think, although if you solve everything there is to solve in one sense. Um, but still, you, have, you can still ask the question, I think. Well, but suppose, I mean, the, 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 suppose, we, suppose I give you all the answers to the easy problems, or, you know, the functional reduction, it's fully there, and then you come to me and ask back, well, but does space time exist? And you're like, well, I told you everything that's relevant to know about that question. What else do you want to, what, what? And you say, well, but my question is, which of these four positions, the or three positions, do you take? Yeah. But then, then, then I will. Um, uh, but then I want to ask why we know. Yes, I, I'm still a bit worried about that, right? Because yes, if you say that we said everything there is to say, 
it then means that you should not say this, right? You should not distinguish between various sorts of functionalism. And maybe that's a good way to go, but I still want to know why we should not do that. And I think it's what's missing to get a complete story. Uh, so. Um, so I wonder if I can just turn this around slightly. And I think the burden of proof is going in a funny direction here. Like in the philosophy of mind debates, it's not like the anti-functionalist comes along and just says, there is obviously a hard problem or an explanatory gap. You get Mary, right, coming out of her room. You get, there's these arguments given about what the gap is purported to be, and they all are based on failure. So what I want to get a handle on, so I don't think it's quite fair to say you haven't solved a hard problem, unless you have, I mean, the, 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 in the mind of it, people say things about the hard problem and about the explanatory gaps. I'm trying to get a real handle on what you take that explanatory gap to be because I think one of the problems is that, that that's not always um, entirely clear. One of the things I thought maybe hinted at what you thought the explanatory gap was, was something I found very surprising. You said this thing about some general relativity. You talked about functionalist or dynamical approaches to general relativity, reformulating the theory. As if there was, in the formulation of general relativity, there was some kind of metaphysical viewpoint about space time. And I think that was very surprising. And I might take General relativity is committed to a whole bunch of stuff. Like if you are a realist about GR, you should be a realist about metric fields. But it's not like general relativity on its feet tells you what kind of ontological category metric field does. I mean, you just get a hundred different answers. Uh, why do you think I was saying that? I don't get it. Because, I, I, because you talked about needing to reformulate general relativity to say take a particular. <coughs> I was just taking GR as a, as a theory, uh, as, on, as a linguistic entity that you can analyze with functionalist tools. And saying that if you want to move to the ontological domain, then you have to many different directions you can go. But I was not saying that. It's, so as I say, you just. I, so what I was thinking was that you, you seem to think you talked about the primitive ontology of GR as if that's something that the theory comes with. So, so I think. But I didn't, I think I didn't talk about the primitive ontology of okay. GR. I don't okay. think so. Well, I mean, th okay. there was a slide where you referred to dynamical relativity and functionalism as a reform as requiring a reformulation use that word, of general relativity. Um, and then at some point you talked about primitive interpretation of, of your own. Yeah, so, so can I try to say what I was yeah, willing yeah, to say? Really so, so, so the idea was um, we have this paper with Niels where we want to um, to try to, um, we want to, sh to show that um, when we, we face this um, conceptual discrepancy between the primitive notions of, of uh, of uh, a QG theory and, and GR, one way to go might be to, to try to reinterpret or to formulate a bit differently or to think differently of, of, of GR. But here I'm not talking about the ontology, I'm talking about the primitive notions, the linguistic okay. notions. So what are what, the primitive what, notions of general relativity? Uh, oh, I, I don't really know, maybe you should ask Niels. I've worked on GR my whole career, I have no idea what those are. So this is, this is this is, I, mean, I mean, I think that there's a theory written in mathematical language and that realist interpretations of it are committed to certain things representing the metric field. And then there's interpretational debate about what you think take the metric field, what kind of category you take the metric field, something like the metric field to, to fall under. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I was thinking that taking a functionalist approach to GR was going to do was, was you take, you have this sort of theory on the table and, and yes, sort of symmetry considerations perhaps under determination worries give you some indication of what kinds of things you take ontologically seriously. Mm -hmm. And then there's a second project of, once you've taken some part of the mathematics to, to genuinely represent physical structure, what, con what concepts that you can import from elsewhere or from previous theories those physical structures fall under. So that, that project is, it's not that GR wears its interpretation on its sleeve, I mean you just, you just can't get enough agreement between Einstein, between physicists to, to think that that happens. There's something for bare theory that everyone will assent to. It probably includes something like the primitive geometric field. Okay, but, I, I, but, I, but I think your gap is depending on some idea that there's, a, there's interpretation of GR that it automatically comes with that's in contrast to quantum gravity. And it's just, that's not, that's not a gap that I recognize in the foundations of physics. Yeah. So I think, I think there's a problem with establishing that there's a gap there to be explained in the first place. Sorry, let me, um, so, yeah, I guess the, the data here is that, so you want to find a theory of quantum gravity, and you have GR as a tool, 
And the idea is that in order, you, you don't believe that uh, we should care about the ontology of GR because you don't really care about, at, at this stage, about what GR is telling you about the world. You just want to find a way to express it in a way which is convenient to, to be related to your theory of quantum gravity. So forgetting about quantum gravity for a moment, I was thinking that there's a project of um, thinking about which structures you take in a theory to be physical, and you might go about that project in general relativity, um, and that might be a lot of what philosophers and physics are interested in doing, and you might worry about you know, where you might sort of have whole argument concerns, etc., etc., um, in there. And then one of the things that I'm trying to advocate for functionalism is that you should perhaps separate that project from the project of working out once you've done that which things fall under the space-time concept. Now, of course, when you, if you establish some relationship between GR and a more fundamental theory, you may change your mind about how you wanted to interpret general relativity. But it's not that there was some, that there's some primitive notions. I mean, it's not like, it's not like GR, every, I mean, of course, there are people who think GR is committed to something like a point manifolds, but that's not part of general relativity itself. GR, GR is committed to, is written in differential geometry terms. And so, and it's not like pointy manifolds are magically space-timey in some ontological category kind of way. So then, so then you discover that there's general relativity and there's some relationship to another theory. And now we can have a talk about whether we should revise um, our, you know, whether we think that there's a sense in which we think the ontology of GR genuinely emerges, or whether we should revise it. And I think that's going to be part of the kind of project that's spelling out all of these relationships that, that Chris is talking about. But it's not that it comes, it's not that in the absence of all of that detail, there's a gap to be explained. Of course, there's gaps if I've just got GR and I've got theory of quantum gravity and I have no idea what the relationship between this theory and this theory is. But I'm still not seeing what the metaphysical gap is once I've. I, I think the only way you can establish a metaphysical gap is by thinking that there's some way GR must be interpreted purely in abstract on its own and that that must be maintained in the presence of, uh, of a kind of deeper understanding of, of how the physical theory fits together. And I, say, I think it just depends on a very, very different conception of what we're trying to do when we interpret theories than the things I have. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm sorry, I think I don't get it because um, I'm not really interested at all about how we should interpret uh, GR leaving aside quantum gravity. It's more like when you experiment that on, for instance, you have one theory which is continue, describe a continuous world, one theory which describe a discrete, discrete world. We have the intuition that there is something uh, difficult uh, in the combination of the two. How, how do we recover continuousness from discreteness? And oh. I think there is an explanatory gap. I'm just saying. Oh, wait, that's a, that's a great question, but it's, it's not obvious that, that that's not much. I mean, the point is you showed that, that you, you talk about how you discover continuous. I mean, we talk about this in fluids and things as well. We talk about how we recover continuous descriptions from discrete descriptions. Um, and then functionalists, and, then, and, and there's a whole load of interesting stuff. I mean, do you take a continuum limit? Do you, there's lots of interesting questions there. But is there a gap left on someone? Well, that question? Then move on to uh, okay. Joanna's question. OK, it's uh, the similar point. Uh, I wanted to say that uh, I see the analogy between um, the case of uh, philosophy of mind and what you said about uh, loop quantum gravity uh, because the second one uh, is connected with the notion of scale so in the case of philosophy of mind we say that we have a hard problem because uh, something um, we ascribe to mind uh, some features from one point of view namely person point of view and we ascribe to the very same object some another features from another point of view namely first person point of view and it seems that these features are inconsistent it seems to me that this is what her problem amounts to but in the case of loop quantum gravity uh, if we build if uh, uh, someone believes that loop quantum gravity really uh, describes correctly our world, then what cannot say literally that space time is at the same time discrete and is at the same time continuous. Um, because um, 
one should say that um, it, at this space, uh, okay, maybe not space time, but uh, so, uh, one needs to say that it is uh, discrete and uh, in some approximation it is correctly described by continuous theory. Uh, but uh, this notion of, of continuity in order to be defined uh, should refer to uh, very small scales on which, according to loop button gravity, space time is not continuous anymore. So literally, uh, one cannot say that it is uh, at the same time both continuous and discrete. And this is uh, this analogy will be the case of uh, mine. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So, I mean, I think here you are using the notion of approximation and maybe of, of, of limit, and the idea will be, well, the world is both discrete and continuous, but it's a matter of scale. Or other option, um, the world is discrete, and when we zoom out, we have the, um, the wrong impression that it's continuous. But then I will say that what it means if in the second scenario is that when you zoom out, if when you zoom out, um, you, you can use a tool which is, which is uh, just space time, which is continuous, still it means that the world is discrete, right? So, so it would be a view in which you are eliminativist about just space time. It would not be the view that the world is both discrete and continuous, depending on the scale uh, of observation. It's, um, because it's more like, when you are at one scale, you see what's, what's going on, really. And when you, you zoom out, you are at another scale where you don't see what's going on. And you have the false impression that everything is continuous. Mm -hmm. so, should we say uh, that it is continuous? Or maybe it would be sufficient to say that uh, to a certain approximation, it is correctly described by continuous? Yeah, but if you say that, I think you are in the eliminativist interpretation because you are um, um, subsuming what you are saying under the clause that it is under a particular approximation that things are like this and like that. So if it's an approximation, it's it's an approximation. It's not purely factive. You're describing exactly what's going on. I think. Okay. Hopefully we have coffee arrived, <laughs> um, and we can continue. Thank you. Is there? Uh, sorry, that people, I couldn't even get to, but hopefully you can attack Baptiste in coffee break. So. <laughs>